Welcome to Adventures in Solitaire. Today we'll be doing a playthrough of Starforged. As mentioned in the intro, today we'll be doing a playthrough of Starforged. This first playthrough video will focus on the background universe and history that our character will find themselves living in. It will also cover the player character and their personal background. We will be saving their current situation for the next video. I will do my best to discuss how each process is handled in the Iron Sworn Star Forged game system. I can say that I'm very excited to give the system a try. I say a try as this will be my first playthrough. I considered doing an offline playthrough, but I felt that I could learn from the community as they learned from me. I thought some give and take communication might be good. So I expect to make some mistakes and hopefully draw some more interest in the game system. When you open the book to learn the system, you will be presented with the system's rules. We will not be covering all the rules before we start, but instead we'll introduce these as they are needed or encountered. The rules do advise setting up your universe before playing, and I agree with this as it sets the tone for the world that your character will be dropped into. This is called choosing your truths. This can be done randomly, or it can be done manually. I had a good idea for the feel of the universe that I wanted to live in, I wanted it to be dark, unnerving, and as real as it can be, while maintaining an inability to be enjoyable. So with that feeling in mind, I ran through the random tables and chose, in some cases blended, what was available. I let those tables guide my imagination as I wrote my backstory. So without further ado, let's continue to Universe Truths. Universe Truths, Cataclysm, and the Exodus. When humankind developed FTL technology, we soon settled a dozen worlds in our local area of our galaxy. We established bases or outposts, star and ground, on many more. All was well, until it was not, and factions began to form. With factions came disputes, and with disputes, eventually, war. Technological research advanced for the purpose of war. A new faster-than-light FTL propulsion method was discovered during this time of rapid wartime research and development. This innovation would not stay in the hands of one faction or another for long. This age of advancement would continue, borders would shift back and forth with no readily apparent gain. As escalations continued, this new FLT technology was fast-tracked and saw major use by any faction or government that wanted to remain a legitimate power. Then, it started slowly. Dock workers and deep space salvage crews talked of people gone mad or entire ships disappearing or left derelict. As time passed, the stories became more gruesome and frequent. It wasn't until one of these rumored incidents changed the course of a deep space naval battle that the stories were made clear. The Earth Defense League, EDL, sent out an entire flotilla equipped with the latest state-of-the-art version of this new FTL technology, now dubbed Dark Shift Drives. The fleet was sent to engage with a rival faction, the United Freedom Federation, or UFF. After the ELD emerged from dark space to engage with the enemy fleet, the UFF command and control ships made record of a range of strange spatial anomalies. The EDL ships emerged in apparent disarray. Some of the ships seemed to be adrift, Others maintained odd flight trajectories that defied normal wartime fleet maneuvers. It took some time for the UFF ships to make contact with their EDL enemy. What they received was broken communication, distorted, they thought, by observed spatial anomalies. They received images of panic and pleas for help or backup. Then came the on-screen images that changed everything. Their enemy turned on each other, and the UFF Though the UFF would win this engagement, the future of the human race was irrevocably altered. Something was wrong with the FTL drives. Major system-wide news networks began to show these gruesome incidents in garbled videos as they were smuggled past corporate, government, or military channels. The deep space sailor stories were now made manifest. They were no longer stories or monsters on the edge of some map. However, Despite public concern, this did not stop the use of these advanced and cutting-edge drives. As time went on, the anomalies discovered during the EDL-UFF dark space incident became more frequent and concern grew across civilized space. 
New FTL flight paths were planned to avoid what now seem to be permanent areas of disturbed space-time. Missing ships began to return from the deep void of space and would launch seemingly random attacks against any target of opportunity. These attacks had no evidence of planning or strategic calculation. By the time governments began to pin down the problem, it was too late. What was once random now became intelligent and coordinated attacks led by their former crew. But they were crew by face and limb only. Those ships that still had crews, or what remained of their crews, had been taken over by some form of intelligence. This intelligence was able to utilize shipboard AI and smart systems to salvage the crew and raw leftovers of long dead crew. Images now shown from video news desks were images of grotesque amalgamations of man and machine. Faction fleet supply lines become tested year after year, then eventually month after month as these dark space monstrosities continued their attacks and advanced their strategies. It was clear to all of civilized space that something had to give or all would be lost. There were not enough resources to counter the losses by the various governmental forces and ragtag civilian militia fleets. The enemy only grew stronger with each new vessel it captured and modified to suit its needs. In the background of all the noise of news of war, other discoveries were made as well. The most notable of these discoveries was a local globular cluster of stars that seemed to hover above our home galaxy. This cluster was found to have promising planets for habitation. In fact, it seemed to break most of what we knew about the genesis process for planetary life. It had too much life, at least if our data could be trusted. The data was hard won as this cluster had its own anomalies. These anomalies made it hard to get accurate readings and measurements. With entire colonies gone dark and some governments in a state of collapse, the UFF sent out a message of emergency unity. They requested a gathering of governments to work a plan to use the anomalies of this newly surveyed cluster as a cover for a new start for the human race. This was a desperate gambit, but it was one that most nations, factions, and peoples agreed on. Small fleets were formed with the new dark drives to begin ferrying supplies and people to our new home. It was found that the larger the fleet, the larger the disturbance to space-time. Large fleets only seemed to feed the creation of anomalies and to hasten the takeover of civilized space. In addition, many private fleets and ships heard the call of exodus to a new home. This led to much smaller groups or individual ships to make the jump themselves many of which were ill-prepared for the hazards that would await them in their would-be new home. One final unanimous law was agreed upon before the first ships jumped to our new home. Once our fleet arrived in our new home, the dark drives were to be destroyed. It would become punishable by death to operate the new drives in our new home. Civilization in the Shroud Cluster Civilization took time to bud within the now-dubbed Shroud Cluster. The cluster provided cover for our species while it took much needed time to establish roots and rebuild. After many decades of searching for new home planets, many colonists were brought out of deep stasis to start rebuilding. Though the number of habitable planets was relatively small, the ratio of habitable to barren planets was extraordinary. Few of the original factions were left with any manageable power structure, the EDF and UFF being among them. Between the big two and a few smaller factions and communities, planets were colonized and civilization started its slow progress to rebuild. Way stations, space bases, and outposts were also formed. It was not long before trade routes were formed among the various spatial distortions and anomalies of the Shroud. The Dark Steel Vow Despite their best efforts, the dark drive use during the Exodus still had residual effects. Many ships were lost and rumors still circulated, much as they did in the early days of dark space navigation, of captains or crew gone mad. Rumors of so-called ghost ships navigating the space lanes waiting for a lone ship to be caught unawares. From time to time, a dark drive ship is discovered abandoned, and on rare occasion, remnants of the invaders were found and taken back, all but with great caution, for research and study. It was from these studies that long dead crew were found, not only combined with human technology, but also with a new form of precious metal. This new metal, in keeping with past naming conventions, was dubbed Dark Steel. Dark Steel was found to enhance communication by a great deal, though research into this property of Dark Steel has been slow and hotly debated. 
there are many who worry that it could, somehow, bring awareness to our newfound home through its use. It had been found to be otherwise, thankfully, inert. In addition to enhanced signal strength of communication, dark steel was found to be exceptionally hard to penetrate. Only the most powerful tools at our disposal could put a dent or scratch in the material. It often takes hours or days, depending on density or thickness, to penetrate the material. Then came the day that an expeditionary force in the fringes of known shroud space found something both amazing and frightening. A large singular deposit of the rare metal was found on one lone moon. It would not be the last time one of these rare deposits were found. The deposits were always shaped and carved with strange effigies or symbols which defied any real attempt at translation. Only those with express permission were allowed to own or store these rare finds of our old enemy and our new home. It was not long before laws and strict codes were implemented throughout known space. They were rumored cases of active dark space technology that had affected crew members or entire ships. This was not sustainable. One by one, settlements adopted a swearing in of anyone who wanted to claim themselves a citizen. This claim became known as the Dark Steel Vow. Different settlements had their own version of this vow, but they all contained the same similar language. No citizen shall make use of or own a piece of the faded dark steel technology without express approval from your local authority. If found, it should immediately be returned to said local authority. These vows became so prevalent and meaningful that some settlements and their governments would issue trophies or wearable tokens of the vow. Some of these tokens, one of especially grave importance, would be in the form of dark steel itself. Anyone who saw a person with the vow knew that something was promised and that it would be fulfilled whether that mean life or limb. Some captains would mount or display their vow at the head of the bridge or at a prominent location for all to see, especially for the captains themselves. Once vows were completed, some captains would hang on to their vow with permission of their local government authority, especially in the case of those ornaments made of dark steel to form new vows. Of Laws and Religion Most of settled space maintains laws similar to those of the Old World. The issue, even more prevalent than in the Old World, is maintaining those laws. There are police forces in most settled systems, but the quantity and quality was entirely dependent on the local government and sometimes the settlement itself. It is rare to find a policing starship outside of a home system or major checkpoint, though they do always patrol the fringes. Religion is also as varied as it was, though in most systems it's not as strong a guiding force as it once was. You can find a colony or two that have its principles and laws guided by their religion, but this is not the norm in the Shroud. Technological Advances Thankfully, many scientists and engineers made the leap to our new home. Though technological progress and resources for maintaining technology have been stretched to extreme limits, there are still advances being made especially where it concerns research into dark steel and dark space. Medicine has not made any advances to speak of, but some of the more major colonies support most of the old technology required to perform needed surgeries or gene therapy in rare instances. AI is still used, though checks and balances are always being researched for fear that they can be used as they were in the past against us. AGI, or artificial general intelligence, is considered a form of blasphemy to most, there are conspiracies of government work on such technology, but no government would ever dare confirm these rumors, even if true. War in the Shroud Even though technological knowledge is still largely unaffected, the ability to replace damaged hardware is still a significant problem for everyone. War is exceptionally rare, even in the cases of border clashes. Most of the remaining governments have even had talks of forming a neutral governing body. Life of the Old and the New Planetary exploration has yielded a treasure trove of new species of life from flora to fauna. Biologists in the Shroud have many generations of research ahead of them. Biological life on its own has pushed entire areas of business opportunities for the various colonies. With the exception of one rare recorded case, dark steel relics have been found in those planets with the least amount of life. Although we're not made for the ecosystems of our new home, they are remarkably similar in a few cases. It's actually possible to remove airtight helmets in some cases for a time. Terraforming ventures were able to launch with record speed due to the close habitats of some of the more bountiful planets. 
Terrors of the Deep. If the deep space tales of ghost ships were a stretch, then so too would be the stories of salvage crew at the fringes of known space. Planetary discoveries have found apex predators of various sizes, but nothing that would be considered to be as invincible or horrifying as spacer crews would have one believe. Nonetheless, those same tales are enough to put some crews on edge, especially those whose careers involve deep space expeditions or derelict salvaging. Hope endures. In the old days, many were excited for the gold rush ahead of them when we developed the first standard FTL drive. Although it was slow, it still held the promise of new homes and new opportunities for families and businesses alike. The Shroud offers hope and opportunities that far exceed those of the generations that came before. Many colonists, businesses, and governments alike see the Shroud as one of the largest reset buttons mankind has ever experienced. Where darkness abounds, hope still shines its light. But hope, much as light, cannot cover all of the corners and shadows that still loom, slowly growing in the peripheral of this new civilization. With our universe truths established, let's go ahead and let's talk about our character and character creation. So this is the world that our character will find themselves in. So let's go ahead and cover the basis of their creation and talk about what I ended up with. Star Force will have you create your backstory before you do anything else with your character. This is useful as you might want to know what you'll be doing and why before you select attributes for your character that do not mesh well with that background. Every last attribute point matters in the Starforge system. Also, these are values that will not change over time. Your character will grow and learn over time, but the base attributes are static, choose and choose well. Now it won't be thin on the next session, but I want to hide some of that for story effect. This system will have you roll on one or more random tables to help you with your backstory, much in the same way that our universe truths were created. If you already know what you want for your backstory, then you may not need to go through this process and you can simply write up the backstory or keep it in your head if you're more comfortable with that. Our character was part of a survey team. He was responsible for managing shipboard equipment and repairs. As the ship's systems expert, he was often required to make best use of a limited amount of resources. Supplies are not in great abundance on the edges of colonized space. Like most crews, he has an acceptable level of experience using required shipboard equipment like flight controls and sensor equipment. He was also expected to join planet-side expeditions and was trained to follow environmental cues, both natural or otherwise. This was also aided by his primary role as ship's system expert, which required a significant amount of deduction and ingenuity. So this is the beginning of the backstory. Again, the rest will be covered in the next chapter or session of this playthrough. Once your backstory is chosen, you will be asked to choose two assets called paths. So we have two new terms, assets and paths. Assets are abilities typically printed out on cards that you can use to aid your character when making difficult check rolls. So as I mentioned before, your attributes won't change, but your character will grow and learn. The accumulation of assets and the improvement of the current assets will be how your character shows growth. Assets can take the form of learnings or even physical assets such as equipment upgrades or even companions. Paths are a type of asset that is meant to show learnings or general abilities that your character has, such as being an engineer, for example. Our character starts with a scavenger and sleuth paths. The scavenger path will help our character when they are investigating wrecks, ruins, or general abandoned sites. In addition, they will also have the sleuth path due to their exploration, engineering, and natural investigation background. This path was also chosen due to the background vow that our character took based on the yet unrevealed portion of their backstory. A background vow should be chosen, though I suppose you could start with that one and gain it later, a character creation. This is the overall life path or quest that your character has taken on. It will take many, many sessions and even campaigns to see this fulfilled. It is even possible that your character may not see their grand vision or life goal completed before they retire. After we have chosen our paths, we will move on to receiving our starship. This is simple as all starship assets are the same, at least at the beginning. Once we have collected our starship, we will move on to choosing our last and final asset. This final asset can be a starship module, which is an enhancement to our ship, companion, support vehicle, or path. 
looking over the paths you can you can see that we start we have the starship on the top left <clears throat> we have engine upgrades expanded hold internal refit missile array reinforced hull research lab etc etc for support vehicles we have things like exosuit or hover bike or shuttle maybe a rover or snub fighter for paths we have a great many options in fact i would i believe we have more options in paths than we do any other type of asset you have ace archer artist banner swarm courier diplomat empath gearhead gunslinger haunted healer infiltrator lore hunter and a great 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 many more from there we have companions such as combat bot or banshee or protocol bot or symbiote and we also have deeds though we will not start typically start out with a deed deeds are something you'll gain through gameplay through the various tasks or objectives that you may or may not complete for the final path my character will be choosing gearhead given his engineering background gearhead will grant us a benefit when we craft repair repurpose or modify equipment or technology i plan on playing a crafty character who uses their wits to get out of situations this may come back to haunt our character as they do not have any noticeable combat abilities the last major step to character design are the character stats or attributes the rest of the character creation involves setting default values on the character sheet and writing down their starting equipment. We'll go ahead and we'll gloss over that part. There are five character attributes that we get to assign a value to. The values that we have to assign are 3, 2, 2, 1, and 1. These are the values that we will add to D6 roles that involve our attributes. The attributes that will make up our character are Edge, Heart, Iron, Shadow, and Wits. If we take a look at the book, it defines each attribute as follows. Edge represents your quickness, agility, and prowess when fighting at a distance. Heart is your courage, willpower, empathy, sociability, and loyalty. Iron is your physical strength, endurance, aggressiveness, and prowess when fighting close quarters. Shadow is your sneakiness, deceptiveness, and cunning, while wits is your expertise, knowledge, and observation. So for our character, I have chosen two on edge, two on heart, one on iron, one on shadow, and three on wits. Defining the current environment, sector creation. We have now set the stage and our character, for the most part, in depth backstory aside, ready to jump into the unknown. Our final steps are to create this sector of space that we will start our adventure within. Sectors are vast tracts of space that can include multiple colonies and star systems, along with other various spaceborne objects or anomalies. I did consider waiting until the next episode for this process, but I wanted to make sure that we could get some gameplay in during the next chapter of the series. So instead of dragging you through two chapters and over a week of waiting, let's go ahead and check out the sector that our character will find themselves in. Sector creation is pretty deep, which is a good thing in my book. You can, of course, go without this and wing it, but I think that we will likely want to have some detail here, and it can help those who, like me, like having these things lined out for us when we can. The first step in sector creation is defining the location of the sector. There are three location types, Terminus, Outlands, and The Expanse. In the order given, these sectors become less and less populated and, in general, far more dangerous. So the Expanse is probably not the best place for a new character and especially a new player. So I have chosen the Terminus location as it is within civilized space. Next we will define how many settlements our sector has within it. I have chosen the default amount of four. For each settlement, we will determine its name, location, and then population. As you can see, we have these listed for each of the settlements. You may also note that we have two planets as one of our settlements is an orbital and the other is a land-based colony. We also have an authority on each planet. The authority is a general idea of how loosely or strictly laws are enforced. We have also generated stars for each of these locations as well. These are all the steps for sector creation. You can manually select any of these or randomly roll. It may be that you want to randomly roll some of these and manually select others for story purposes. 
There are additional details that you can gain about these planets and settlements, but I have purposely chosen not to get this data for narrative purposes, which will be made clear in the next episode. Once you have your stars, you will then mark them on the provided hex map. The game states that the hexes do not represent any real distance and they are just there for visualization purposes. We will now need to find out how many passages there are in the sector. Passages are lanes of travel. All travel must be done through these passages. In my narrative, these passages represent the most common and safe routes through known space. It is possible to find other passages, but we are not worried about that right now. The book suggests three passages on average for a terminus sector, and we will create just that. You will then connect the stars and the sector together. It might also be wise to use one of those passages to create a safe exit from the sector. You could always have your initial sector cut off from the rest of the local galaxy for thematic purposes. I would love to leave this sector stranded for theme as that sounds fun, but this is a first run game and I don't want to kill us off just yet. And last but not least is the introduction of sector trouble for our sector. Now we are doing this out of step, but I felt it would be best to do this for ease of understanding. The rules have a table for sector trebles, and I have rolled one up as you can see here. Sector trebles just give us some additional flavor for the sectors. You can always use another oracle aside from the simple table roll if you would prefer. The final steps are to create a local connection that you can interact with. I agree that this would be a wise idea. After this we would be laying out our first minor or major missions, but I am saving this for the next chapter as that would spoil the fun. So I have rolled a connection. For connections, you will create, select, or roll for the following info in the book. Name, role, goal, aspect, relationship rank, and home. Of those connection details that are not so obvious, we have role, which is a job or position that they hold, aspect, which is their overall demeanor, and we have relationship rank. I think this bears the weight of needing further attention. When you hear the word rank in the system, this refers to the difficulty rank of some task. Tasks in the system are called moves. So the relationship with our connection has a difficulty rank of troublesome. You can also think of difficulty ranks as DC checks from D&D or other similar systems if this helps for as a comparison. Troublesome for reference is a standard difficulty. We will go over difficulty ranks in more detail as we learn the rules, but I think we can leave that be for now. With that, we have covered everything that we need to start the next chapter or episode, so I think this is a good starting point. We certainly have an interesting first sector to play in. I am so very excited to see where the story will go once we are finished with the initial setup. I will begin working on the next video as soon as this first episode is up and ready for viewing. I hope you enjoyed it so far, and I look forward to your feedback. So, with that said, if you watched all the way through, or not, either way, Thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks.